sounds good to me. Um, uh, welcome back to the Lake Erie Library. Uh, I am Beth. And I'm Britta, and I didn't realize we were starting, so I'm oh, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm ready to go. Ready. Beth, Beth's ready and raring. Yeah. So today, we are going to discuss... Um, a book by one of our favorite authors, and that would be Different Seasons by Stephen King. Or as I like to call him, Uncle Steve. Uncle Steve. Um, So, fun fact is that this book was published on August 27th, uh, 1982. So it's having a birthday. That's really wild. It is really wild. You're listening to this much later, but it is August 27th, 2023, as we're sitting here recording this. Yep, so it's having a birthday. This uh, was written as it's four short stories or novellas. Uh, it's it's a hefty uh, book. It's 527 pages long. Stephen King has gone on to say that he wrote the book because he had written these different stories. Like for example, he wrote one right after The Shining. Uh, I'm trying to remember which one it read that he apt people apt people. Um, so he wrote these like kind of in between um novels and he presented them to his editor and his editor's like wow because at that point he was getting kind of typecasted as a writer and like successfully so as like a horror author and all of these stories explore essentially they do explore different seasons they do explore um they're all kind of set in different like in different seasons um but they all explore different themes but all of them have horror elements to them but they're not a straight up horror story so his editor was like we can't publish these by themselves and they're they're novellas so novellas are notoriously hard to publish by themselves people don't want to pay full price for a novella correct and by this point because this is 82 He's at this point. He's already dropped the Bachman pseudonym. Is that correct? I think so. I think so because yes. this is this is after uh, the Dark Half, which is essentially his. He did that as his killing of Bachman. Correct. Okay. Which is the whole plot of the Dark Half. So, so he also could not publish them under the pseudonym which he had been publishing these sort of stories under. So he. So he wrote four different stories. Um, The first one is Rita Hayworth and the Shawshank Redemption. Let's just, let's just like, we'll just go through. Okay. We'll we'll just start there and then we'll just, we'll we'll hit them all. So uh, at this point, if you have not read Different Seasons, you probably shouldn't listen to the rest of this episode because we will be spoiling things. Um, If you want to read Different Seasons or if you're like, I didn't want to read it, but now I'm intrigued. Just be prepared for spoilers ahead. If you're just really big fans of Beth and Britta, please listen. (laughs) Right. Continue on. I'll also add the caveat that if you have not seen the film adaptations of the three stories in this that have them, which would be Apt Pupil, Shawshank. Shawshank Redemption and Stand By Me, which is not the same title as the story, but it is the adaptation of it. Uh, and you don't want those spoiled for you. Don't don't listen to this until after you've watched them. So you have some homework is what we're telling you gently. But moving on, uh, the first story is uh, Rita Hayworth and the Shawshank Redemption, or just and Shawshank Redemption. I was just gonna say yeah. I always forget that it is not the Shawshank Redemption. Right. Thank you for it the movie. <laughs> Shawshank Redemption, uh, and that is the Hope Springs Eternal section of the book. Yes. Yeah, so it is. It is themed around springtime and the idea of hope, and it is. It comes from the point of view of Red, who is a long time, long time person person who lives in the jail he's, I, I, yeah, yeah he's he's an, an inmate. inmate he's been incarcerated uh, he's an incarcerated person and it takes place like he's telling it in the 70s but it's taking place from like th- 20 30 years ago and the idea is that he is essentially writing this memoir down of like this is what life was like at Shawshank and um, let me tell you about the story of Andy Dufresne who 
was a inmate at Shawshank uh, and also led kind of this daring escape. And yeah, so that that's kind of the st- that is the basic gist of the story. It obviously goes into a lot more. I I waver between this and the body as like my favorite stories of the four. Um, this has just so many beautiful quotes and like lines in it, and um, it's just so well done. The movie adaptation is so well done, which is it's considered one of the best film adaptations of Stephen King's work as as well as like Stand By Me. Yeah, I really feel like the the movie really fleshes out the story quite a bit more than the novella, which makes sense. It is a feature film mm-hmm. versus a novella, but it this is almost like the I don't know, like the the rough pitch sketch of <laughs> of the movie. It's also it's, it's as most Stephen King stories. It is, it has some ties in with other Stephen King, right, right uh, books, and even within different seasons, there are some connections between the stories. Yes. Um. I don't. It's it. You know. It's it's the same for me. It's hard for me to choose a favorite out of this book. I mean, I do run a race that is <laughs> themed around Shawshank Redemption. Um, I've run it a few times now and it is at the Mansfield Reformatory where they filmed the movie and I know this is 2023 and next year there's like an anniversary of the film so it is going to be like a huge deal with that and it's hard for me to separate the film from the short story. Very much because it it ties in so it is it is a very good adaptation of it like there's very there's very small differences between the two i would say the biggest one of the biggest differences is that red is played by morgan freeman in the film whereas this was written um and red is described in the book as a white character with like red hair Um, right but i don't I don't think that takes away from it and I listened to this book as a audio book and the narrator sounded Morgan Freeman-esque mm. which I feel like was like if you you know once you've set the gold standard of Morgan Freeman's voice like it's hard to to do anything different than that I you know and Beth mentioned that this is sort of the theme of hope and it does have one of my favorite quotes in it which um, I will read to you right now just remember red hope is a good thing maybe the best of things and no good thing ever dies i will be hoping that this letter finds you and finds you well which is from the end of the story but i just love that hope is a good thing maybe the best of things and no good thing ever dies which is an incredibly important thing to fixate on when you are telling a story of incarcerated people because what do you really have to go on right other than hope right and so much of the story um you know you have red kind of explaining life in the clink as he likes to describe it but so 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 much of it is you as the reader learning kind of these ideas of like how systems and stuff work like for example the character of red is he's a man that knows how to get things um they never really quite explain how he gets things which i feel like would like you'd lose the magic of how does he get these things but they go you know go as far as like the detail of like at one point um so you have andy dufresne who is this banker and he is accused and like found guilty of murdering his wife and her lover even though there really wasn't great evidence for him to be locked up he was still because he was so cold and calculated during the trial which he was just trying he was like not a very emotional man he didn't like he wasn't like righteously angry he was just very cold and kind of the jury found him in the book and in the film the jury finds him like guilty because essentially he's not like emotional and emotionally charged with any of these ideas about his his murdered wife right like they're i mean when they're questioning him and they're saying like well did you go did you go to quentin which is the man that his wife was cheating on him with did you go to his house and kill the two of them and he's like very calmly just saying no i didn't you know like i i drank a lot i was starting to sober up i decided to go home instead and when i drove home you know 
I was beginning to think that the wisest course would be to simply let her go to Reno and get her divorce. And he's like, oh, well, then then who did you shoot first? Did you shoot Quentin first? Did you divorce her with a thirty eight revolver? And he's like, no. Well, then you shot her lover. No, sir. So you mean you shot Quentin first? I mean, I didn't shoot either one of them. You know, I drank two quarts of beer and smoked however many cigarettes the police found at the turnout. And then I drove home and went to bed. Like, it's just very matter of fact. And yes. And the jury finds that not compelling enough that they they say he's guilty. So he does not adjust well to life. They in. Al- they uh, also Shawshank. never find the murder weapon because he says he, th- he no. threw it in the river. And they're like, oh, well, that's convenient. Right. Um, so he goes to Shawshank and Red is a long timer at Shawshank and he, they, uh, right away, Red and his like people that he's like friends with and they do it in the movie as well. They're like, oh, he, Andy's not going to make it. He, he's, it's so, so well casted in the movie as well, but he's explained as this kind of like soft spoken, like wears glasses, like slight man very unassuming he's a banker so you're just okay so he when he does go to red finally he asks for a rock hammer which is kind of an unusual request and red goes to explain like how much the rock hammer costed in like the 30s as opposed to like the 50s um so this story takes place over decades of uh the life in prison yeah i think uh when they sentence him, when they sentence Andy to prison, it's like for two life sentences, mm-hmm. essentially. And um, so that's like one of the first things he asks for. And then eventually he asks for for this poster of Rita Hayworth. And I I love in the story, too, when Re- it's like a very folksy. I, I know some people have issues when King gets like this and he gets kind of folksy and like, well, let me tell you now about this. kind. Of, I love that for this character, though, for Red telling the story. Right. And I love it's it, he's just like, well, I remember the first time Andy Dufresne got in touch with me for something. I remember it like it was yesterday. That wasn't the time he wanted Rita Hayworth, though. That came later. In the summer of 1948, he came to me for something else. And then he like, <laughs> goes on this whole diatribe about how the the prison is set up and and you know with the we've got the license plate factory and then we got the automotive garage where they fix prison state and municipal vehicles and then there's a big stone wall full of tiny slit windows and where cell block five is and he uh, also explains too like all the stuff that andy goes through which is like like andy is and i i don't think it's taken lightly but it's stated so matter of fact that until you're watching the movie and even the movie it feels very matter of fact but it's so dark like Andy is assaulted and raped multiple times in prison and he does try to fight back and it's to like no avail like he's still he's overcome by these people that are raping him and like I said they don't they don't take it lightly in the book but they also like It's like, it's just like a part of life. Yeah. I mean, along with, and I don't know if it's, I can't remember if it's in, in the novella or not, but in the, in the movie, they really just introduce you immediately along with Andy to prison life with the like, oh, fresh fish. Here comes the new batch. Who do you think it's going to be? Who do you think is going to cry first? Do you think it's going to be this guy? Right. I think it's going to be the banker. Oh no. I think it's going to be the, the fat guy in that cell and they start picking on the new guys and there's the scene where he's like whispering around the corner like hey hey you need someone to look out for you i got your back there's a bunch of people who'd love to make you make you their guy you know with that big what do you say like your big tubby tush or your big your big butt or something like Mm -hmm. that and then the guy starts crying and then everyone cheers because they like took bets on it it's yeah like out in the workyard andy points out to red that it's there's quartz and it's like soft stone and things he can carve and so he asks for a rock hammer and has to describe what a rock hammer is and then red doesn't want to get it for him because he thinks it's a weapon right and the and the one thing that red does point out though is that so many men in prison like forget about pretty things and that it's so important to not forget about to not forget about these things that are like important things like art things like music things like books and 
uh, one of the most striking scenes, which I think that's why the movie is such a great adaptation, is it, it just literally lifts lines and scenes from the books. But one of the most striking scenes is they have to tar uh, the roof and the head prison card is played by Clancy Brown, who is in Highlander. But for our younger viewers, you would know his voice anywhere because he voices Mr. Krabs in SpongeBob. And he plays the head prison guard and he's like moaning and groaning to the other prison guards while these men are tarring the roof, including Andy, about how his brother passed away. But like the government's going to take like this forty thousand dollars that he was like bequeathed and um, essentially like just moaning and groaning about like the tax system and stuff like that and how he as the prison guards always getting it from both ways. Like, you know, he's overworked, underpaid, and then he's also overtaxed. So Andy boldly, but also dumbly like walks up to him and says, hey, and the guards are like, oh, my God, like you think it's going to be a prison standoff. And like in the movie, he's like thrown over where he looks like he's about to fall over the side of the building. Cause he's being held over that. Yeah. Clancy Brown like grabs him by the lapels of his work shirt and is sort of bending him over the side of the roof. And so Andy Dufresne explains to him like, Hey, like I know of a way that you can get around like these taxes. Like, do you trust your wife? And at first he thinks he's being like fresh about it, but it, it's not, he's like being like genuinely like, I'm a banker. I know these things. I know how to like for you to keep your money. And they describe like this beautiful May day of them at like 10 in the morning doing like this hard labor of like tarring a roof, but like something that you would do as like a free man. And because of the trouble Andy went through, he was able to get some cold or well, it wasn't cold. It was warm beer. Um, but beer for uh, these other prisoners that are working with him because Clancy Brown's character is so happy with uh, this information and that it's genuine and that he's like saving this money. So that's kind of the start to his relationship with uh, the administration, which you find out in Shawshank is very corrupt. I would say it's as corrupt as like the criminals that are in the actual criminals that are inside the prison. Well, I think the point that King makes with the story is that truly the administration is more corrupt right, than right. the people who are incarcerated. And that's a, a running theme with Stephen King actually. And um, you'll see that in the green mile as well with sort of the injustice of the justice system and how backwards it is and how easily with with like that system of power how easily people are just sort of thrown thrown under the bus and and wrongfully forced into situations and so they in the in the movie i know one of the the more heartbreaking moments for me is um oh, gil, devastating well gil bellows's character who's the younger guy his character name is like they, do they just call him like the kid or the something kid, like that yeah. um he's you know he's a younger guy he's he's in Shawshank for the first time but he's been in and out of prison throughout his life he's, he's got a baby and a he's wife. got a young wife and a, like a, a young daughter who I don't believe he's ever met because she was born while he was incarcerated and Andy as this like educated man sort of takes him under his wing and is like you know you could you could get your degree what you could get your GED you could finish high school while you're in here we have the means of it I'll help you study I'll help you take the test and first of all when they get the results well when they're taking the test Gil Bellas's character gets frustrated he's been told his whole life that he's nothing that he's worthless and that he's just going to be in prison all the time and so he doesn't want to turn in his results because he thinks he failed and then Andy submits the results anyway right. <laughs> and he ends up passing and he gets his GED but Andy isn't even able to celebrate with him because Andy is in solitary confinement at the time. And the one guard comes and tells him when he drops off his food, like, hey, the kid passed with the C. I thought you'd want to know. And before Andy even gets out of solitary, because of what the kid knows, which is that Andy is actually innocent. The kid has evidence as a witness um, because at one of the former prisons he's in, he was with a guy who was bragging about killing a banker's wife and her lover. And essentially, like, 
it all coincides with Andy's yeah he's stuff. he's bragging about how he used to work at a golf club like a, a country club and he would use it as an excuse to case all the rich people and he knew there was a golf pro and he knew that he could go and rob him and when he went to rob him Andy's wife was there with him he murdered both of them and then he sort of jokingly says you know like and the best part is the, like I didn't even have to get caught for that like they sent the banker to jail and the kid kind of puts two and two together he's like hey, like I think that's Andy and he goes to the warden about it mm-hmm. and the warden has him murdered as a result he gives him an out and he asks like would you be willing to go in front of a, a a court and testify to this and if he said no he may have lived at right. least for a short amount of time but he says yeah absolutely and so he has him murdered and that's you know it's before andy can even find out that he has this like information that could get him out of jail right it's it's so sad and i think in the book in the book, Andy does know about this information. Uh, I think they, for the movie, for dramatic, I think they changed that slightly. But so the reason the warden doesn't want Andy to leave is because essentially after he did the thing for the prison guard, that kind of opened up this like relationship where they realized that he, as a banker, is smart. So they make a point to say like all of the guard, or, like a few of the guards had their taxes done once and then like the next year all of them had their taxes done and then the year after that the baseball they have their intramural baseball team with another prison come on the same day so that all of those guards got their taxes done and Andy essentially becomes kind of the accountant of but he's you know being exploited for his labor like he's not being paid for this he's incarcerated he can't go anywhere um but with kind of this clout he has he does try to make things better like he tries to expand the library um and he writes to like senators and stuff so he's a very smart man and he's trying to essentially give exactly do what he's supposed to give these prisoners hope and a scene that's i don't think it's in the book and i can't now i can't remember but the scene in the movie where he like locks everybody out of the warden's office and then he puts on a record and he puts it on the loudspeaker so like all the prisoners can hear this beautiful opera music um is so i think kind of quintessential to this message of like you should always have hope and hope is like supposed to be beautiful and you should cherish and love these beautiful things and take and don't take them for granted because when they're stripped away like what does that strip away of you um and the warden essentially is the most corrupt of all because he's exploiting Andy and that's why he doesn't want uh, this witness to come up, the kid to come up front because then he would lose uh, essentially Andy making him extra money. Yeah, he is also exploiting the prisoners because in the novella there is the inside out program. Oh yes, yes. Where they send prisoners out to do like day labor on things and he is basically um exploiting these like local contractors who are hiring them for work because you know it's essentially and i i don't like to use this term but i can't think of a better term but it is essentially slave labor and that's how they phrase it in the novella um and so he's he's sort of blackmailing them that like all right well you can use my prisoners but you're gonna pay me in cash under the table for that work and that's why he needs andy to sort of cook the books right for tax purposes and um he the passage where he's like talking about this he king says andy dufresne was his right hand in all of this his silent partner the prison library was andy's hostage to fortune norton knew it and norton used it andy told me that one of norton's favorite aphorisms was one hand washes the other so andy gave good advice and made useful suggestions and i can't say for sure that he hand tooled norton's inside out program but i'm damn sure he processed the money for the jesus shouting son of a whore (laughs) So after the kid is, like, murdered, that's essentially the impetus for Andy to... Tommy. Tommy. That's his name, Tommy. So that's essentially impetus for Andy to be like, I need to get out of here. Like, I'm... I don't want to be here anymore. Red kind of goes into an aside. Um, They do talk about other... Like, a lifer that is released from prison, and he used to be, like, the library... Essentially, the librarian... 
he gets out and he doesn't adjust well to life outside of prison. Yeah, because I think it's um, his situation. And this is sadly, this is a real thing that happens is he Brooks was incarcerated when he was like 18. Right. Or 19. And he's now like he's in his 60s, I think 50s or 60s. At yeah. This point. So he has he has spent essentially his entire adult life in jail where right. you are told when you go to bed you are told when you get up you are told when you can eat you are told what you do you and where told you go when, you're pee- when you have to pee yeah like there's a line about that in the movie with um with red later where he keeps asking his boss if he can use the bathroom and the the manager of the grocery store is just like you don't have to ask me just go pee he's like i can't even go unless i ask like i'm so conditioned to do this so yeah that's he he has trouble adjusting to outside life once he gets out and you know he's he's old so he is slow to move on things and he doesn't quite understand how the world has changed like in the movie he makes a comment that like when I went to jail like cars barely existed and now they're like flying down the road right they make an aside of that and he sadly he takes his life outside of prison which is sad also one of the more heartbreaking scenes from this film and Andy essentially talks to Red and tells him like there's a place and and it's actually one of my favorite Family Guy um, references is uh, Family Guy does an episode on Three Kings stories and one of them's on Shawshank and they make a point of Peter being like or not Peter Cleveland being like where the heck was that place again <laughs> um and I was like, yeah, if you have a bad memory, this would be not great because that's all you got to go off of. Um, but Andy tells him, like, there's a place in Mexico on the Pacific Ocean uh, that, you know, one day I would like you to meet me there. And, like, you need to go to this small town with this, like, rock that has no, like, place being there. <laughs> it's a, so it's, to, we're going to back up, like, two steps. Yeah. He... Andy admits to Red at some point that he had like $14,000 that he put in a bank before he right. came to jail. Um, he, he says like, I started selling like my Rembrandts that I had. Um, I sold my stocks and like paid the capital gains tax and I declared everything. Like I did it all by the book and Red's like, well, wait, didn't they like freeze your estate? He's like, well, here's the thing. I was charged with murder. I didn't die. So you can't, freeze the assets of an innocent man and he he says outside these walls red there's a man that no living soul has ever seen face to face he has a social security card and a main driver's license he's got a birth certificate name of peter stevens nice anonymous name huh so essentially he has this whole life that he has formulated for himself under the name of peter stevens right and this like small fortune And he says, like, someday I am going to own this, like, resort, essentially, in Mexico. Like, I have enough money to buy it. I just have to get there. And he describes a wall in the middle of a field near a large tree where there is a lava rock. So it is a black rock and a wall of gray stone. That has no place being there. Yeah. You know, so essentially, Andy's Andy escapes prison. And Red goes on to explain exactly how he escaped prison. So um, the poster, which it started with Rita Hayworth, but it changed over the years. Linda Ronstadt was one of them. Mm -hmm. Uh, In the film, Raquel Welch is one of them. Raquel Welch. So essentially, because he's there so long, he changes ladies. Well, he also Um, has the hole keeps getting bigger. So he has to get new posters to cover the expanding hole that he has been slowly chipping away with his rock hammer which to cover he has also been carving the stones from he's picking up things out in the workyard and making like chess sets Mm -hmm. and like beautiful pieces so that it's sort of covering it as a hobby as a, a means of killing time innocently but really he is tunneling his way out of prison right with a rock hammer so it takes him years to tunnel out with a rock hammer but he does it and he does it of a night of like a big storm. So he's like able to bust through and nobody's the wiser and he covers it back up with the poster and he literally crawls through the sewer tunnels. So they're like, he crawls through um, poop and comes out clean. Um, it's like 
three miles of shit and came yes. out clean because he comes out in like a rainstorm in the movie. Yes. And so I, just, I love the scene though where the whole reason they discover this is and it's in the book as well. It's like on March 12th of 1975, they say in the book, the cell doors and cell block five opened at 6:30 a.m. as they do every morning around here except Sunday. And as they do every day except Sunday, the inmates of those cells step forward into the corridor and form two lines as the cell door slams shut behind them. They walked up to the main cell block gate where they were counted off by two guards before being sent on down to the cafeteria for a breakfast of oatmeal, scrambled eggs, and fatty bacon. All of this went according to routine until the count at cell block gate. There should have been 27. Instead, there were 26. After a call to the captain of the guard, cell block 5 was allowed to go to breakfast. And they essentially, like go through their normal thing in right the, in the movie they don't count them separately they just like make everyone step out of their their cell and they see that andy isn't coming out and they think he's just being andy and sort of like screwing with them again right and then they get there and it's empty <laughs> and so he's like uh in the in the novel in the novella it's in a case like that, you might usually have is someone who's taken sick in the night so sick you can't even step out of a cell in the morning more rarely if someone has died or committed suicide. But this time, they found a mystery instead of a sick man or a dead man. They found no man at all. <laughs> and it's just so, like, it's so it's so good. It's so hijinksy. And then the best part is, is, like, Andy kind of gets one over on them. And with, with him missing, like, the police start investigating more into Shawshank. So I believe the warden does get his comeuppance of, like, kind of the final he shouldn't have been doing what he was doing yeah in in the film andy mails um like information proving that the warden has been committing fraud right in the novella i'm i don't remember how they're clued in on that um i can't remember off the top of my head either uh i do remember he gets his come up and um why we are uh, looking into that i would just also say that red after all of this because he's writing it in past tense does get out he actually gets out on parole which was surprising to him and he starts to go through some of the same things that brooks does where he's put in a halfway house and he's takes a job as like a grocery but he too was a young young man when he got when he got incarcerated so he's like the world has changed a lot and he he's the one that talks about like having to use like the bathroom schedule like he can't pee unless it's on command full of really despair and he's like I don't I feel like I should go back and to me I think that's also a poignant part of the story is just that you have this system in place that essentially breaks the spirit of people and then like the one person that you would expect it to be broken of bucks the entire system because he has hope yeah i think that's also maybe where the casting in the movie works so well as well with andy's a white guy and red is a black man right and you know it is a it is a fact in the united states that there is a high number of wrongfully incarcerated specifically men specifically black men in prison right now who should not be there so exactly and like lifers which is awful but yeah so eventually red is on parole and he decides you know what it's i don't want to end up the way of brooks i don't want to kill myself um i am not gonna make it here doing what i'm doing now probably not in my best interest to rob a bank and go back to jail right let me just let me just see if andy was messing with me i'm gonna go look for the rock and he by god finds it yep he decides to break his parole he finds it and hidden where this rock is is like a thousand dollars yep and a letter or a postcard postcard telling him exactly where to go yeah he, well he, in, maybe in he so gets much. the postcard first and this is yes. what tells him to go there um and the, the postcard doesn't have anything written on it it's just postmarked from texas and red looks it up and it's right along the border and he realizes that's probably where andy crossed into mexico and he finds the letter and that's where the quote about hope is and so he takes the money and he goes to meet andy and in the film we see this reunion which always makes me laugh because it's like he just tells him go to this place in Mexico, but it's like not specific direction. So I'm like, did he just get there and like 
just wandered around until he like magically found and him also, on the beach working Andy on a just, boat. Is Andy just always outside working on this boat? Yeah. Like, <laughs> and I was like, maybe, maybe he's like the only like like non Latin white guy around and so, you know, Red could have been like, Hey, do you know like this white dude? And they were like, Yeah, this is the weird guy on the beach. But like really very st- I need more information about this. And in the novella he has not actually done this yet. He's like I'm his, writing this down because yeah. I'm going to do this. Yes. I'm going to go try to find Andy. Um, so definitely worthwhile. It is such a strong, what a strong start to the stories. And you you end, and it's like a happy, kind of a happy ending to like what is otherwise a pretty depressing story. And then it leads into apt pupil. <laughs> Before we go into apt pupil, I do want to point out that the end of the story, as this is the Hope Springs Eternal section, the end of the story, like the last five or six lines, is they all start with, I hope. I hope Andy is down there. I hope I can make it across the border. I hope to see my friend and shake his hand. I hope the Pacific is as blue as it has been in my dreams. I hope. So nice. Yeah. (laughs) And then we have to go to Apt People. And then we go to the summer of corruption, Apt People, which Beth did mention. um, Stephen King wrote this right after he wrote The Shining. And there are some ties in this story two other Stephen King stories, including Shawshank Redemption. Right, right. Um, which we'll bring that up when we get to it. But um, in The Shining, Jack is writing a play. Right. The play includes a person with the last name Decker. Yes. Uh, which is the last name of a character in this story. I would... I would say one of the main characters. And so it is somewhat implied that Apt Pupil is the story Jack is writing in The Shining. Which is pretty also messed up because this story is really dark. This is, I think, in my opinion, the the closest to like a, a full horror story yes. in this. I think it has the most horror elements to it. Yes, both real... It, I mean, they're all realistic horror elements. Like, this would be... This doesn't have any supernatural elements to it. It's all very much uh, realist. This could happen in real life. I thought it was interesting. I didn't realize this until I read this uh, recently, that it's the only novella narrated in the third person. Um, I didn't realize that. And I was like, that's really interesting to me. That's true. Um, But the plot synopsis is you essentially have a teenager named Todd Bowden who's described as like this blonde, uh, very kind of precocious and apt pupil. His teachers have all described him as an apt pupil who lives in this like pretty well to do kind of normal, uh, suburban suburb of Los Angeles. And he, arrives at this like house of this old man this uh elderly german gentleman named arthur danker um and says i know who you really are you are actually uh you're a nazi and your name is kurt dusander um and the whole even i knew even from the start like i kind of had a like i went in pretty blind like with i knew at pupil was a movie i knew kind of a basic premise of like oh somebody's accused of being like a nazi i think about this now and how this book would never have been written now um because there's so much uh divide there's so much like where people are like, well, are Nazis that bad? And I'm like, yes, they're always bad. Yes. I, 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 there's like learn, no ands, ifs, or buts. Learn, they're always bad. Learn from Indiana Jones. Nazis are bad. Punch them in the face. I'm not saying that. Please don't do that. You'll go to jail for assault. But, you know, spiritually. Inside your em. mind, punch, punch them em. in the face. So anyways, he, uh, Dusander or Danker essentially, den- he denies it at first. And this kid is. Todd is really persistent. Todd is so persistent that um, I remember when I was first reading this story and I would come to work and I would talk to Britta about it and I'd be like, I don't know how I feel about Todd and I don't know how I feel about Dusander. Like, I don't like them either of them. And I was like, I feel kind of sorry for Dusander. And I was like, and I feel sorry in a way that I am not comfortable with because like, I'm like, I can't tell at this point 
of the story, I was like, I can't tell if he's actually a Nazi or if this kid's actually just terrorizing an old man. And then Britta's like, no, no, listen on. It is definitely... He's a Nazi. Just just reserve your judgment and don't really feel sorry for anyone. (laughs) Just wait until you hear the rest of it. And this is, I think this is the biggest story of all of them. Like, it's a chunker. It's pretty long. And isn't it, it's like each section of it is like a different month. Right. And it takes place over four years. So essentially, Todd kind of blackmails do sonder into telling him about his war criminal days like yeah like asking i mean it's just so gross the things that i always remember is like how todd is like relishing these just heinous stories about like the the sexual assault of these women in internment camps and just like really horrific disgusting things and he's like titillated by it yes and let's actually talk about like that's his first like wet dream is about uh this assault and this abuse and this torture and so at first arthur kind of acts like a victim in this in that he's like telling him but he doesn't want to he starts getting very sickly very gaunt and then todd starts becoming haunted by kind of these stories and they're like he's so fixated on him that his grades start to slip and he's kind of in this fix of like he can't study and stuff because all he keeps thinking are about these like horrendous stories and he keeps like looking up photos and information about these things that he's hearing about which is how he originally recognized him isn't it he saw a photo of of him like at a camp at like Dachau or something yes he was at a friend's house and they were reading he saw magazines of the friend's dad in the garage and he was reading through them and he just he thinks they're neat which to me that's a red flag I'm like any person that thinks like Nazi Germany is neat yeah like red flag red flag even even here like there's a section where where Dusender is telling him about um if I hadn't followed orders, I would have been dead. And so he, he was breathing hard, his upper body rocking back and forth in the chair, making the springs squeak. A little cloud of liquor smell hung around him. There was always the Russian front. Um, our leaders were madmen, granted, but does one argue with madmen, especially when the maddest of them has all the luck of Satan? He escaped a brilliant assassination attempt by inches. Those who conspired were strangled with piano wire, strangled slowly. Their death agonies were filmed for the edification of the elite. Yeah, neat, Todd cried impulsively. <laughs> like, it's, it's ew. upsetting. It's upsetting. And then, so essentially, because Todd is put in this situation where he his grades are slipping and if his grades are slipping his parents are going to get involved because he's essentially lying to his parents and saying oh mr danker's just really lonely um i go over there and i read to him this is and um, there's like a weird pseudo reference to this in modern family in an episode where the son keeps going over to their weird neighbor's house and the like weird neighbors, this old cranky man, and he keeps asking them like weird stories, and he gives them a TV, and then they find out that he's like a terrible person who's done terrible things. Oh no! <laughs> um, so uh, Danker essentially, so first they like fudge the report cards, but then the counselor's like, no, no, your grades have slipped too much, yeah. so he requests to see the parents. Like he's, so he's getting D's and F's. He keeps changing it, and then his it's like his guidance counselor is saying you know we have to have a meeting and so todd gets Dusander to pretend to be his grandpa. his grandpa so Dusander explains that his parents are going through a divorce and that's why uh, essentially his grades are suffering and then Dusander in turn so the power is all with todd but then Dusander turns around and makes a power play and is essentially like i will go to your parents if you don't start studying so um, I had to look this up because I was like, there's something about the the tension in this story is about their mutually assured destruction. And I know that's like a term we use for like nuclear war, but it really does apply here in like the simplest like of definitions because they are in this terrible relationship of one person making the other person worse. And they're in this 
terrible situation because one keeps assuring the other one that like if you don't do what I say I will like essentially destroy you and like one keeps one upping the other so uh Todd says like I have a friend I wrote a letter to and I will if something happens to me I'll tell them everything yeah and then Ducinder is just like well that's cool I have a safe deposit box that has information about you in it so if you kill me they're going to know what you did. So they essentially, over time, because this starts out with Todd being like in junior high and then he's like in high school or like about to enter from junior high to high school and then he's like a teenager. Essentially, over time, they like kind of wax and wane apart, which is good. But then Todd and Dick, De- Danker or Sander both have these dark urges that are fueled by these like stories. Yeah, and it progresses to um, both of them actually murdering several unhoused people. Yes. And this is, that's what leads to the inevitable downfall is, is that a witness who is also an unhoused man later recognizes. Right, right. Um, but p- before that, so they're both doing that. Uh, Todd also keeps going to this like hill that's over by a highway with his hunting rifle and like acting like he wants to commit some shootings, which is terrifying. So while both of them are murdering people, um, Du Sander suffers a heart attack. Yes, and Todd does find him. And helps him get rid of yeah, the body. Yeah, Danker calls him and is like, hey, I need help. You're like the only person that can. And Todd doesn't even question. Yeah. He just helps. So then Du Saunders stuck in the hospital because he does have a heart condition. And then this is where, because you're like, you as the reader are going to be like, where are we going with this? And this is where King adds a new element. And then another man. Um. Morris Heisel. Morris Heisel. You find out he is a Holocaust survivor. Is put in the same room as Du Sander. Yeah, and he recognizes him immediately. But yes. he's just like, Why, where do I know you from? Where do I know you from? And he's just like, oh, you know, just got one of those faces. Don't know. Don't know why you know me. Leave me alone. Whatever. While he's in there, before the big revelation happens... Um, Todd does come to visit him in the hospital and he admits like you know I don't actually have a safe deposit box like nothing's gonna happen when I die but um, I do know what you've been doing I've read about you murdering these unhoused people and you need to be better at it don't get careless right right he's like we're we're done like everything between us is done that's my final right he essentially just wants to like because he's like, I, I'm eventually going to die. And he just kind of wants to die in peace at this point. Todd has a hard time with that. He's like angry. Um, and that's a lot of like, there's just so much anger between the two of them that it's like, it's so hard to read or listen to it because you're just like, like part of me is like, Todd, this was your fault. This was your fault to begin with. But then I was like, Danker's also like a terrible person but then I'm like would have Danker done these horrible crimes if he wasn't pushed by Todd or would he have just kind of lived in obscurity and drank himself to death like an old man but then I'm like he's still a Nazi so yeah I don't have any sympathy for that no yeah it's uh, it's so yeah they're both terrible people they're both terrible people um and before we, we wrap this up with, like, the f- how this story resolves, uh, in the movie, like, the casting of this movie is great. Yeah. It's Brad Renfro, who has, he passed away, but was really kind of like a teen heartthrob mm-hmm. when he took on this role. So that was, like, a very interesting career choice. I mean, probably smart on his behalf so that he wasn't just constantly cast in those type of roles to show he had range, but he did, unfortunately, pass away pretty young. And then Ducinder is... It's like, it's Gandalf. Yeah, it's Ian McKellen. (laughs) Ian McKellen. And one of the most disturbing parts of the movie for me is when Todd makes him put on his Nazi uniform. Yeah, that's really disturbing in the book, too. In the book, he's like like yelling at him. And he, you know, to start, 
Deucender's kind of begrudgingly doing it and is like really playing up like, well, I'm an old man. Like, I'm, I don't want to relive this. And Todd's just like yelling at him to straighten his hat and get those feet going, start marching and like about face and keep screaming at him. And in the movie, like the fervor with which Ian McKellen is marching back and forth through his house, it is terrifying. Like it is the intensity of it is the thing that I remember the most about that movie whenever I think about it. And it is funny now. I mean, it's not funny now, but like the the ending of the movie is a lot different than the book. And I, I do feel like because of when this was made in 1998, it very tellingly why, because we, this was the era of, Columbine and everything else and kind of the beginning of school shootings and stuff like that so with the ending of the book um do sander commits suicide um after he has found it's c- like coinciding yeah um, morris well morris realizes why he knows him it's because he was a a a guard he he, he essentially was an officer was, he was yeah. an officer at the camp where morris's wife and i believe his daughter as well were murdered right and so he he knows like he's basically found out and so Ducinder steals drugs and ends his own life and then uh, and then it hits the, the papers time. um it hits the papers and so then all of a sudden todd's under suspicion like and uh, one of the detectives who's investigating, obviously, and who's working with, like, the, I think, the CIA or FBI. So one of those two, like, they interview Todd, and they, like, don't believe him. They're like, no, no, something is off about that kid. Something is suspicious about that kid. I don't know if you can hear this noise. I apologize. We have, like, a vacuum going <laughs> or a leaf blower or something. So there's nothing we can do about it. It's just adding to the tension. <laughs> so... um so then Todd, another part of his story starts to un- unravel because his ca- guidance counselor had met uh, Dusander and then at a conference accidentally meets his Todd's real grandpa and figures out that Todd was lying. And then he goes to talk to Todd, um, especially after they find out that Dusander was a war criminal and Todd at that point has like a mental break. Yeah, he essentially has a mental break and goes on a shooting spree. Yes, and that is how the story ends in the book is that it ends with him being surrounded by police in a, like a, a gun standoff. Um, in the movie, I think it ends slightly more peacefully um but it's still not well good no it's not it's essentially he in the movie he doesn't Ducinder doesn't kill himself with pills he like cuts off his oxygen or like he he gives himself an embolism and he dies that way and then Todd's guidance counselor confronts him about him lying about his grandfather and then Todd turns around and blackmails the guidance counselor by saying that he was like making inappropriate sexual advances so it's just like starting a new a new wave of mutually assured destruction yeah um so yeah this this story is hefty i i had a very hard time getting through it i wanted to keep reading it because i wanted to see what happened but at the same time i was like like there's there's nothing that feels good in this story also the very like the really disturbing part in the story where Todd's like trying to lose his virginity and he's dating that the girl and she yes. happens to be Jewish and he yes. keeps saying that that's why he's like he can't he's he's, he's essentially he can't um well he's having erectile dysfunction yeah he can't get it up <laughs> um and he's he's stating it's because of her rather than he's just having some issues because everything that he's been stimulated by has been violent yeah um so yeah this this story is it it's a lot um and it's definitely a good chunk of the book um which makes the next story the body before we move on okay before we move on i do have a few things left to say about this oh (laughs) um i'm just now realizing that this was a brian singer movie which makes the ending even even ickier with the blackmailing of an adult man and a child yep 
Yeah. Um, so that's, you know, another story for another day. But uh, in this story, Dusender mentions that there was oh, a bank yes, in I Maine where he purchased stocks under an assumed name. And he goes on to say that the banker who bought them for him went to jail for murdering his wife a year later. And he remembers that because he remembers his name sounded a little like mine. Like, you know, Dusender, Dufresne. Mm-hmm. Danker. Yes. So it that's the tie to the other story in different seasons. And then he also when he um is confronting Todd about murdering the unhoused people, he calls him Spring Hill Spring Hill Jack, which is the name of the campus murderer in Strawberry Spring, which is a short story from a different short story collection called Night Shift. Right. Which if you listen to our summer horror movie episode uh we will mention night shift in that as well yes so okay that is all i had to say about that people let's move on to the body yes uh so the body is also the body is so good um that's called fall from innocence as like the theme um and that essentially the plot is about four boys who live in castle rock in the movie stand by me it's set in oregon in the book obviously it's maine and it's about four boys who all kind of come from broken or like not quite nice suburban homes like they all kind of come from this small town with semi broken homes who the like labor day weekend decide to find this body that they find out by mistake that this like one of the characters older brothers was talking about it how they they found a body by mistake but they couldn't go to the police because they were driving a stolen car so if they went to the police the police would be like how did you find that out and oh you stole a car so they decide to uh these four boys decide to go on essentially a long camping trip to find the body to come back and essentially get uh fame for it uh small town fame with the main characters being so there's Gordy, there's Chris, there's Teddy, Teddy and Vern. And Vern. So Vern is the one with the older brother that finds out about it. Um in the movie he's played by Jerry O'Connell. Yes. Uh Teddy is played by uh Corey Feldman, which this movie I think is one of the most perfectly casted films that I can think of for Stephen King ad- adaptations. Yeah. Um Will Wheaton plays Gordy and then uh, River Phoenix plays Chris and it's just so well done. It's and it's very much a coming of age story and film. Like I remember watching this movie growing up and not realizing that it had any ties to Stephen King. Right. And now now knowing what I do about Stephen King and about the story and having read the novella, um, I also didn't realize that this was isn't this the first castle rock production movie yes, yes. that rob reiner started castle rock yes production company because of his love of stephen king movies yes. and this was the first one that he adapted um so this is told from gordy's point of view so it's him as a, a man talking about this adventure as a 12 year old boy um and essentially it's kind of like a camping adventure so they start off with like well you tell your mom that i'm staying at your house and you tell your mom that we're staying at his house so none of the parents talk to one another so they're all able to get like off scot-free for a few days um gordy is the main character you find out he has an older brother that died and he's kind of living in the shadow of his older brother's death um everybody knows him as as being uh god what is his older brother's name as being like his kid brother and stuff like that so they just treat him like his own parents just kind of ignore him like he's just kind of there and chris comes from like a very abusive household he upon them leaving uh gordy finds out that chris has a gun uh which comes to use later in the story and then teddy's dad is in a institution because he is a a world war ii soldier a veteran of world war ii and he is suffering from like ptsd um this is set in like 59 so it's like long enough after that like this would have been kind of the norm of like yes we did have soldiers that we weren't like helping essentially with 
these issues. Yeah, and it wasn't like the inciting incident that had um, his father sort of sent away. It was he was, he was abusive. Like he like smashed Teddy's head against like the oven or something like yes. that because he broke a plate. So. Yes. And then Vern has, like, his older brother is just kind of a terrible human and bullies Vern. And he's, you know, he's running around with Ace Merrill, which is, in the film, he's played by Kiefer Sutherland. Yeah, thanks, Kiefer Sutherland, (laughs) who's Um, also, like, a terrible, really, like, dirtbag human. Yeah, and Ace Merrill, actually, he is in other Stephen King stories. He is um, really a key component in uh, Needful Things. And he is mentioned in a few other ones as well. I think he also goes to Shawshank Prison at some point. I think maybe it's a needful thing. He's just getting out of Shawshank. So that, Not surprising. that is another tie amongst the stories. But um, And this Ace is just still sort of a juvenile delinquent menace to the town. So they, you know, they describe going like they cut through uh, a junkyard to get some water and they meet chopper who is like of local legend like that dog from the junkyard kind of you know we grew up with like the sand lot so it's always there's that junkyard dog right so and they heard that chopper's like gonna bite your head off right he eats kids for breakfast and then he's just like a regular dog <laughs> yeah and isn't it, it's like a maybe i'm remembering this but isn't it like a little dog in the movie too isn't it like a terrier or something like that or am i misremembering this i don't remember that but i just I did remember like the chomper sick them yeah uh then they they get almost ran over by a train which is so train one of the best parts of the movie yes like they can feel the rags vibrating Oh, it's so good. Um, And then they, then of course, uh, in the book, Gordy goes on to, uh, there's a flash of one of his stories that he wrote. Um, These are the least, my least favorite part of this. I hate these like interstitched stories. There's two of them. There's Stud City. Stud City's pretty wild. And that's essentially Gordy's like, one of his stories he wrote in college so i think they just do it to kind of work your way up to the real like the only to me the only appropriate story that should be in there which is um about lard ass hogan yeah the revenge of lard ass hogan um and so that story because they all know that gordy wants to be a writer he tells stories teddy likes all of his world war ii theme stories but he essentially tells this story about uh lard ass hogan which in the film um, I know the first time I watched it, that was shocking to me. Like, it's essentially about a pie-eating contest with a, a plus-size guy um, who is, like, just always berated for his weight, um, getting the last laugh by essentially sabotaging this pie-eating contest and drinking a whole bottle of castor oil and throwing up blueberry pie on, and starting a chain reaction of everybody throwing up. Um, visually, completely different than like the rest of the film. I think I enjoyed it better in the book. Watching it on screen is something why Rob Reiner does a good job with it, but still wild. Yeah, it's I. Ugh. I just I hate I hate the stories existing in the first place, and then I I don't want to watch people barfing on each other, and it has like like projectile the same- vomiting. Growing up, our like our generation, we grew up on the Mara Wilson Matilda, and I had the same fear watching Bruce eat the chocolate yes, cake yes. and looking like he was going to vomit that I have sitting through this section of the film. <laughs> After that, they go and they find like a cool wading pool, and uh, they get leeches all over them, um, which that part truly is probably the most. Ho- it's pretty horrifying um them talking about pulling off the leeches um gordy gets one stuck to his testicles <laughs> and it makes him like faint yeah um he's like i still have a scar from it i'm like wait does that actually happen i don't think that's true i feel like they don't they're not supposed to bite that cuz like they, they use them medicinally still today so they, i mean i don't know that they leave scars i think that they just sort of like get fat and fall off and yeah that's it but so then as an aside chris and gordy have this chris and gordy's friendship is different than 
them with the rest of the boys and Chris and Gordy are kind of treated as having like a higher intelligence but Chris unfortunately is kind of like he's smart but he has such a terrible family reputation that that precedes anything that he does in his life yeah it's it's a similar situation to like Tommy in Shawshank Redemption where he's just been told he's he's from nothing and he's never going to be anything and so you kind of he starts to believe that he internalizes that and that's right. really like uh, River Phoenix RIP what an incredible actor right. we were truly robbed I, f- I think about this often about what movies he probably would have been in and how incredible he would have been in them but he is just superb in this movie and when they have this conversation about like the teacher yeah and there's like a like what's what is the money for i can't remember it's like lunch it's like lunch money like it, she accuses him of stealing lunch like it was like lunch the milk f- money or yeah. something like that and and he's he you know he didn't steal it and no matter like how strongly he tried to like voice his innocence everyone took that as him being guilty and then he like mentions like and then I saw her next week and she had a new skirt on. And right. So it's implied that the teacher took the money herself and just used him as an out because he was just such a throwaway person in her mind. And it's just so heartbreaking. It's yeah, it's devastating. And, you know, Gordy essentially is like, you know, he he's like telling him, like, you're going to get out of this town, like you're going to like get out of here. So he essentially says, which I think. I honestly think this is some of Stephen King's best writing. Like, there's so many lines that hit you like a gut punch. Um, And he talks about how you have people that kind of pull you down and you can have friends that kind of pull you down. And it's you have to worry about kind of yourself and bringing yourself up. And especially with socioeconomic situations and stuff, it can be really hard if you're caught up with like a group of people like you're going to want to be with your friends and it's it is harder to break away from that than it is to be with that. Yeah, it was it's I found it right here. It's on 395 in the hardback copy and he he says, you know, like Gordy says, "Chris, why don't you go into college courses? You're smart enough." And he says, they decide all that in the office and in their smart little conferences, the teachers, they sit around in this big circle jerk and they all they say is, yeah, yeah, right, right. And they give a fuck about is whether you behaved yourself in grammar school and what the town thinks of your family. And they're all deciding whether or not you'll contaminate all of those precious college course douchebags. But maybe I'll try to work myself up. I don't know if I could do it, but I might try because I want to get out of Castle Rock and go to college and never see my old man or any of my brothers again. I want to go someplace where nobody knows me and I don't have any black marks against me before I start, but I don't know if I can do it. Why not? People. People drag you down. Who, I asked, thinking he must mean the teachers or adult monsters like Miss Simons who had wanted a new skirt, or maybe his brother Eyeball who hung around with Ace and Billy and Charlie and the rest, or maybe his own mom and dad. But he said, your friends drag you down, Gordy. Don't you know that? He pointed at Vern and Teddy, who were standing and waiting for us to catch up. They were laughing about something, in fact. Vern was just about busting a gut. Your friends do. They're like drowning guys that are holding on to your legs. You can't save them. You can only drown with them. And, God, it's so haunting, and but, like, so prominent. And that's all I kept thinking is it's like a perfect coming-of-age story, but, like, it's it's going to stop and make you think, especially as an adult, and so after the leeches they finally do find the body and at this point they're like out of food they're tired they got lost along the way when they find the body even though they had a head start over like ace's gang ace's gang quickly catches up to them and gordy at this point is just dumbstruck at like they're all dumbstruck at seeing this like this kid that's their age who had died from being on the train tracks essentially and the thing that like really chills Gordy is that the kid's shoes were knocked clean off of him. Yeah. And just how pallid and like he looks like he's sleeping essentially. Like he doesn't even essentially he doesn't even look that dead, but like he's clearly dead. Um he says the kid was disconnected from his kids beyond all hope of reconciliation. Yes. God. There's See? I love that he's got these little word nuggets that just really like get in there and stick with you and his description of his dead body is so visceral 
Like he's describing the ants and bugs all over his face mm-hmm. and how they're going in and out of the collar of his t-shirt and how his eyes are open but terrifyingly out of sync. One was rolled back so far we could only see a tiny arc of iris. The other stared straight up into the storm. There was a dried froth of blood above his mouth and on his chin from a bloody nose, I thought. And the right side of his face was lacerated and darkly bruised. Still, I thought, he didn't really look bad. I had once walked into a door my brother Dennis was shoving open, came off with bruises even worse than this kid's, plus the bloody nose, and still had two helpings of everything for supper after it happened. So it's like that that when you're a kid, having to sort of like connect in your brain. Right, that this person is doesn't look that like you could be alive and look worse and this kid is dead and looks less bad than you did yeah i and i think that speaks to the fact too that i mean gordy is our narrator so obviously he is the one who is telling us this but of them gordy i mean his brother died so he does have this experience with death Mm -hmm. and so i think that is sort of important that he is the one who is sharing this with us and as we try to watch him just like connect that in his brain and make sense of it yeah yeah i would agree so ace and his gang come and find the body um and they essentially are arguing over it yeah they're like we got dibs and um gordy they gordy has like this moment of just like utter they they essentially say the massive balls he has on him because he essentially taunts ace and then chris gets out the gun that he brought and he essentially threatens them and he fires like a warning shot and so ace and his gang leave but then after all of that happened um the boys realized that they didn't want to give they didn't want to take recognition so they essentially they're like i they so they came all that that way for kind of nothing because they decide they're not going to uh go back and tell where the body is um so then they have to like make their way back uh to to town yeah there's at the end of this like fight with uh the older boys with ace and his gang though there's this moment where like Chris like trips over Ray Brower's body and he falls and Gordy's first reaction when he like falls off this embankment is to check Chris's feet to make sure his shoes are still on because he's so haunted by the fact that Ray's were knocked off. Right. And he says like I looked wildly at Chris's feet to make sure his sneakers were still on and then like he finds him splashing in the water and he's he's like okay and so you know he's like crying and they're flabbergasted by that because chris doesn't show emotion that way but he he is just like oh he's alive like that's about as alive as you can get is having this strong of an emotion and then then they make their way back um and so when they make their way back essentially ace threatens them and says you'll you guys will get yours so they get back their parents aren't even like phased that they're they were gone then like a month later gordy's walking down the street and like ace pulls up and beats the ever-loving crap out of uh gore enough that he lands in the hospital and chris also got the crap beaten out of him and both of them were uh interviewed by detectives and neither of them would narc on who beat them up (laughs) yeah um and then you haven't read uh needful things have you i have not well polly chalmers is a character in that and she is the one who actually comes and like breaks up the fight like Mm -hmm. when ace is beating him up and like gets the police she like calls the cops right so that is i think that's all of these like castle rock stories like he really and truly puts everybody in everything it is a small town in this world right so and then um the story kind of ends with kind of how they all go their separate ways so you know you have um gordy grows up goes to college he actually helps chris get into these honors classes and study for them and gets chris into college but then you find out that all of the all of the boys died except for gordy yeah Vern Vern dies on a house fire teddy dies in a car crash and, and then, then chris dies by 
he's breaking up a bar fight and essentially gets wounded in the bar fight. Um, and that was after he had like gone to college. You know, they just talk about like, have you ever been friends with anybody like you were when you were 12 years old? Like the chances are no. And one of my favorite quotes from this story is the most important things are the hardest things to say. They are the things you get ashamed of because words make them smaller. When they were in your head, they were limitless. But when they come out, they seem to be no bigger than normal things. And I think that's so telling of like both a writer, like from a writing perspective, but also just like in general, like it's so true. Like you want to declare your love for like somebody, but then you like panic because when you are saying it, it doesn't feel the same way as it does inside your head. You're like the words are, you know, just not quite the same. As as the epic rock ballad put it, more than words. Yes. <laughs> um, this, uh, this story does have some real life uh, issues attached to it. it there are accusation, accusations of plagiarism. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> um, one of King's friends, well, former friend, they are no longer friends, but George McLeod claims that he actually wrote a short story that then King stole for the idea for this and published it and he like tried to sue him for it um, and he was just like I want some of the royalties from Stand By Me that you're getting and so the this whole like court case ended their friendship but that is the reason why King is known for he has what he calls dollar babies where if you are like a film student and you want to adapt any of his stories you can pay one dollar and you have the rights to make that movie Mm -hmm. and so there's like a lot of his short stories that do have like short films made of them that these film students got the rights for one dollar but he because of this he um he has like made it a firm stance that if you ask like hey could i send you my script for like feed he won't read it he's Mm -hmm. just like legally i I cannot handle that liability. I will not read it. Don't send me your stories. And that's because of this, because of the story. And this guy saying that he stole it from him. The next uh, next one, as we move into winters, the last, last one is The Breathing Method. A winter's tale. And um, this is... It, for it's the shortest. It's the shortest. I was going to say, for all of the other ones, it feels like it moves almost the quickest um it's told in a frame narrative where it's a story within a story so you meet like this lawyer who goes and and he's like a middle-aged lawyer and he gets invited to go to this mysterious like place in manhattan and it's like a after hours club which is also in another short story yes um i thought that it was in a different short story collection it's actually in skeleton crew and it's the man who would not shake hands so i as a small aside i had to look this up because between the two of us i have read the dark tower series and that is on britta's to be read list um so i'm always like where's the connection where's the connection Mm -hmm. um and i i told her as soon as i read i said i feel like this has a dark tower connection and this story so People on Reddit also feel the same way because I looked it up and they're like, yes. And there's like on Stephen King fandom pages, the theory is that this mysterious club, it's referenced to have like books that were never published in other places. And it's talked about having multiple doors. So the whole point of the Dark Towers, everything's connected and that there are other worlds than these. So that is a working theory. Uh, Stephen King has not come out and directly said, I mean, I guess he has said in a way that everything's connected so it probably is a part of the dark tower but he's never like definitively like ah yes the club is definitely a part of the dark tower it's definitely a portal to other worlds um but i'm just under that assumption that it is yeah it's like um it's not necessarily a a liminal space but it is like sort of a an in-between space like it's not quite normal society it's not quite secret society it is like this in between place between them where these people are congregating to share stories and that's uh, that's all they're doing it's it's just like a gentleman's club where they share stories so it so it starts with this lawyer and then it kind of the actual story that 
is describing the breathing method is this doctor tells of this story of a patient he had who was pregnant, but this was like during the 1930s and with her being pregnant, she was single and you know, that's a big no, no back then you did not have babies out of wedlock and he becomes her OB GYN essentially and he teaches her how to do Lamaze which at the time <laughs> which is so funny now because you know as a as a child of the 90s I remember Lamaze being all the rage like I remember you know with having siblings born at that time like I remember like it being talked about in like Rugrats maybe or the Simpsons or definitely like I remember that word being tossed around. Yeah, I think everybody has this mental image of childbirth as involving, like, rhythmic (laughs) breathing. Yeah. Sorry, guys. You get to hear. (laughs) Like, that kind of thing. So, essentially, he teaches her the breathing method, and they go on to develop this, like, relationship. It's beyond kind of friendship, beyond kind of doctor-patient confidentiality he even goes as far as to say it's like kind of surmise that he's like a little bit in love with her he just likes her spirit he likes her as a person and she's due in winter she's actually due around christmas and and she's worried he's not going to be around because he's you know a doctor and that's always like a that is a pregnant person's fear is there's not going to be somebody here for me during my time of need it, it picks up really fast yeah. after that. So there's a giant ice storm and she calls him. She's actually overdue and she calls him and says, I'm finally in labor. So he's like rushing to get there. But with this giant ice storm, he he walks it because that's how close he lives. But she's in a taxi. Correct. And, and the taxi is then involved in an accident. Yes. So um, kind of the climax of the book and this is this is probably the only part that gets a little supernatural is um he he gets to the scene as he sees this accident occurring the doctor does and as the doctor is walking up he essentially sees his patient's body she has been decapitated yeah, by the accident but no there's so no her, head. her body is in one place and her head is located nearby so he's like we can still save the baby and he sees her head doing Lamaze, essentially, the and breathing method. There's, like, a description where he can, like, hear he can like hear it coming from, like, her neck, where her neck would be attached to her head. Right. And then, like, he sees her chest on her torso moving. Like, contorting, and, yes. And so he is able to help her give birth and he, he in the street says like as an aside like i know how weird this sounds but this is what happened to me like she should not have been able to give birth i would have had to do like a c-section essentially but she pushed the baby out and, and then yeah and then before she finally passes like he he tells her like that the baby is um it's a boy and he like makes sure that she knows that and she manages to like say thank you yes and this is she passes (laughs) (laughs) you know they say like the human body is only like this your body only functions your head only functions like five seconds after you get decapitated and long enough for you to like blink and that your body they have found studies that your heart can live like up to three hours after you die so but this is still kind of stretching you know your paranormal imagination and it kind of ends with him like like just kind of like this was this weird story i had and it's not i guess it's not necessarily a spooky story well it's a spooky story but it's not necessarily like a a horrible story because he goes on to say that like even though this child is adopted like this child lives his best life like he goes on and is like very successful yeah he like is able to find he's able to find him and like you know follow along with his life and at the time that he's telling the story like the baby is 45 or 44 so right this is decades that he's been keeping tabs on this baby and And yeah says that he has his mother's hazel eyes which now has been ruined for me by (laughs) harry potter thank you harry potter you have your mother's eyes um so put those back (laughs) So yeah, that's that's how uh, different seasons ends, and it as I said, it 
it is kind of a great just jumping off point for Stephen King. Like, if you've never read, if you if you want to read stories, but you don't want to read like a big chunker of a, I mean, this is a big chunker of the book, but really it's four stories in one. So if you wanted to kind of get into Stephen King, this would not be a terrible place to start. Um, Agreed. And, you know, it's we we chose this as our sort of first foray into book discussions with you because one, Beth has read it very recently. (laughs) And uh, while we both really enjoy Stephen King, we have read different books of his that don't necessarily overlap. So. I've been on a reading journey of reading all of his works in publication order from start to finish. And I've made it to insomnia and that is one heck of a big book. (laughs) And I haven't read any of the dark tower and Beth has read all of it. And so we, we thought this would be great because it's fresh in her brain, but also because we are moving into a different season of this year. Yeah. Felt, felt right. It felt right. And especially because I didn't realize it was publicized. Uh, yeah. Uh, like, it's wild. It's what a, a weird coincidence. Kismet. Yep. Kismet. So it's all Ka, baby. It's all Ka. I know that that is a Dark Tower reference. It is. But I have not read it. So. It's okay. You'll get it Doesn't mean eventually. anything to me yet. Um, well, I was going to save them for the end of my King journey, but listen, Mike Flanagan. I know. I know. He, I it's it's gonna happen and it's gonna be great and I love him and uh, I'm sure we will talk about some of his movies and Stephen King adaptations on this podcast as we move forward but uh now I feel like I have to read it before they get everything together (laughs) after the writer's strike and the SAG after strike and start working on on that one but our next uh book related episode won't won't be for a while we we want to Maybe do one a month. We'll see what's going on. But uh, the next title we're going to read, if you would like to read it before the episode comes out, a little bit of a podcast book club with us if you want, Yeah, is uh, another one of our favorite horror authors, Grady Hendrix. His most recent book, How to Sell a Haunted House. Yes, I think you will enjoy that with us as we journey into a whole other different type of horror compared to some of the things we've witnessed in different seasons more standard horror yes <laughs> less speculative horror yes <laughs> less existential horror so uh thank you for listening to us today uh as always please subscribe please tell your friends tell your enemies follow us on instagram at the lake erie library erie with two e's and uh, thanks to our wealthy benefactor. Oh, yes. I pr- we haven't thanked them in a while. So thank you, thank you, thank you once more. <laughs> thank you, wealthy benefactor. I feel like Pip in <laughs> Great Expectations. Isn't that the right Dickens book? <laughs> Should we make them a pie? I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. They would enjoy that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> That's right. good to know. So, uh that wraps up this episode. Thanks again, folks. Yep. Stay spooky.